I disliked him immediately. He acted like he was supposed to be there, like he belonged there, but he didn't. The other guy, the other minister who had confirmed us, had confirmed me, with whom I'd sat and had my conference and explained why I wasn't sure I was ready to be confirmed because this is kind of a big deal, and I didn't know that I had it in me. I didn't know if I had it together to, to do that. The guy that I could talk about football and baseball, the guy that I could talk life with in church, he was the one who was supposed to be there, but he'd moved. And this other guy had come in, and I didn't like him one single bit from the very beginning. But I went to youth group and to Sunday school and to church on Sunday morning still because that's what we did. I was raised to do that. I was taught to do that. That's what our family did. We were part of the church, so we'd go. And it had always been easy when the other guy was there, or easier, because he was such a compelling speaker. Uh, even when I was in junior high, I wanted to go and, uh, and listen to him. He just captivated me. The new guy, not so much. So, one Sunday, we were having Sunday dinner, and we were talking, as we sometimes would, about church, and about the sermon, and about the minister, and the, in this case, the new guy. And Dad said, you know, it is not the preacher's responsibility to serve up what you need on a platter. It is your responsibility and mine to show up and do the work and to find something in what's said that is valuable and meaningful to us, something we need, and to take that away. Well, I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> Nobody else had said that, and that stuck with me, and it still does. It was later that I realized this was probably what Dad was saying in various forms to all the other people in the church and community who didn't like the new guy either. Well, Jesus is, in the story, he's not the new guy. Although he is. He's been away from home. He's changed. He's not the Jesus that they knew when he left, I'm sure. So when he... <clears throat> comes to Nazareth, having sort of been circling through towns and villages in Galilee, um, creating sort of this buzz. He, he shows up, Luke tells us, um, having been water-washed, wilderness-worn, <laughs> Satan-tested, and full of God. There we go. A little drama about that. <laughs> this may go on a while. Who knows? Uh, these were doing this the other day when we came in. Um, so Jesus arrives with this buzz around him. He shows up, um, people talking about him. And it's a Sabbath day. So he comes to church as he's raised to do. It's part of who he is. It's part of his family's habit. And in this service, in this synagogue service on the Sabbath, either he volunteers or he's invited to read and speak, as would be the custom, especially with um, somebody coming home, somebody like him who's created this buzz. And so he either chooses or it is given to him, I suggest that he chooses to read the words from the prophet Isaiah, because these are words that resonate in him. So Luke tells us he's given the scroll, and he unrolls the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, 
and he finds the place, this would be in chapter 61, where it says, God's spirit is, has caught hold of me. And so I am sent to bring good news to the poor, to set free the prisoners of war, to restore the sight of those who cannot see God in the world anymore, to bring freedom and liberty to those who are crushed by the oppressor, and to announce the time of God's favor. And I imagine him not just reading this, but reciting this from memory. Even though he's got the scroll there, I picture him with his eyes closed, almost acting this out. It's coming through him. It's a, a 500-year-old promise. It's a post-exile text, Isaiah 61, with a little bit of Isaiah 58 mixed in there. So Jesus and or Luke are editorializing. How about that? Can you do that? He could. He did. So we have it on good authority that it's, it's okay to do that, at least if you're doing it with integrity. And he offers this up, this 500-year-old promise to a group of people who have just returned home from several genera generations in exile. Now he offers it to this people his own people, who are themselves exiles in their own land, who are prisoners of war, who are captives of the domination system of the Roman Empire. Exiles in their own land. Do you suppose our native siblings, the indigenous people of our nation, could tell us what that feels like? maybe have been trying to tell us what that feels like, what that experience is, have been trying for generations. Maybe now we're beginning to hear exiles in their own land. Well, I think Luke and or Jesus are applying this old text, this old promise to everybody in Galilee, in Samaria, in Judea, all of those living under the thumb of Rome. And after reading this, Jesus, Luke says, rolls up the scroll and gives it back to the attendant and goes and sits down. It's, everything is slowed down so that you can feel a sense of anticipation in the room, in yourself, you can almost hear people holding their breath. Somebody whispering, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? What does he say? He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Greek word that is translated has been fulfilled, uh, peplerotai, I think, peplerotai actually could maybe in this case be better translated is fulfilled, is happening, is coming into being as you hear it. In other words, this ancient word is occurring, it is, it is happening, it is becoming real as it comes into you, as it takes root in you, as it bounces around in you, as it takes up residence and sounds in you and resounds through you. Now it happens. Notice he does not say, I've got the Spirit and it's all about me. I'm the only one that can do this. I know more than anybody else about this. You, you have to have me. You have to vote for me. It's all about me. He doesn't do that. He actually says, it's about you. Yeah, <laughs> it's about you. There should be some blinking at that. <laughs> yeah. If this is going to occur, if this promise is going to be realized, it's going to come into being through your being, through your life, through your owning it and living it. 
So the new guy <clears throat> is not a mesmerizing preacher. But he compensates with other gifts. As is often the case, right? We find out over time that he is extremely patient and generous and very kind and gentle. He's a sort of a connector. He sort of brings people together and then sort of gets out of the way. So he watches and listens to people as they interact. And he invites different configurations of people together for different things. So would you help with this program? Would you come and help me run this camp? Would you be part of this work project? Would you um, head up this team, this committee? Would you be part of it? I became one of his targets, along with all kinds of other people that he would call on for various things and bring us together and then kind of let us go. So that, he, he pulled me into so many things that by the beginning of my senior year, this was, he'd been there a couple of years, we had a relationship, we were connected, and I no longer disliked him. I was trying to understand him, and I certainly appreciated him, and we'd gotten pretty close. So that when my dad had a heart attack 47 years ago today, January 23rd, 1975, and is taken to the hospital, the new guy is there with him. When we gather early, early the next morning, it's still dark at the hospital to learn that dad didn't make it through the night, the new guy is there with us. He's there to conduct the funeral and the burial. And he's there for me then afterwards, reaching out again and again and again, very quietly. Let's have coffee. I'm gonna go here, you wanna come along? just over and over again. And he would say very little, but he would listen a lot. And he was just there, constantly reaching out, being present. He was there as it was time to talk about college. And in college, he shows up then with a question, have you ever thought about maybe going into the ministry? As he's pulling me into church stuff, helping serve communion, preaching when he's gone, all these things, you know, just very subtly or not so subtly, mm, nudging, nudging. So we talk about seminary and where I might go. He's there to officiate with the chaplain at Gustavus at our wedding at Christ Chapel when Julie and I get married. And then he's there at a distance, listening and watching when we go off to Denver, for several years to seminary. He's there and stands up with me and lays hands on my head when I'm ordained. And then about 12, 13 years later, give or take, he's there with a letter of welcome as we are sent to a new place and it turns out to be the church where he now attends. And in the letter, he tells me that he's looking forward very much to my being his pastor now. And things turn. So now I'm there with him as his health fails. And we talk and we prepare. And then I conduct his funeral when he dies. friend, colleague gave me this poem that just came kind of roaring into mind as I was thinking about the new guy and about my dad and about connections and about all of this. The poem is called When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. <clears throat> when great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. 
lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nature, now shrink, wizened, our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us, they existed. They existed. We can be. Be and be better. For they existed. Great souls aren't necessarily flashy. So what was it in that great soul that called him to invest so much of his time and energy and self in me? What was it that he saw, that he sensed, that he heard, that he felt, that elicited that? Well, what about you? Who was there for you? Who called you out? Who supported you? Who challenged you? Who loved you? Who saw in you something Beautiful, living, powerful, promising, good, beautiful, rich, and invited that out. Who was it that fed the fire in you? Who lifted up the life in you, this one life that we all share, that we all express uniquely? Who lifted that up and held it up in the light so you might see it for yourself, what you carry and what the world needs from you, what God has invested in you that you might bring into the world, into being. Jesus comes to Nazareth, and they know him, but they don't know him. And he comes to church, because we come to church, because we need to come together. We need to be together. And he reads this word. He recites this word that is now his word. God has got hold of me. The energy, the power, the spirit, the being of eternity of all creation is inside of me. So it calls me to bring good news to the poor. To bring release to the prisoners of war and violence and fear. To restore the sight of those who cannot see God in the world anymore to set free, to liberate those who are held under any oppressor than to announce the time of God's favor. Now, now, today, today, you, you, you. Amen. Amen.